Oh, hello, hello, hello. Going from one Brit to another Brit. This Brit lives in Copenhagen, wonderful Copenhagen. Welcome. Wait, wait, wait. Just pick any chair you like. No, I'm thinking. Sit where you like. 4.40. We're doing this at 4.40, that very strange time between coffee and beer. If you're Danish, it's just time for beer, I assume. <laughs> so welcome, welcome to um, Labster, a Danish startup. As I take off my glasses, you'll notice throughout the whole session, I cannot see you, but now I can see this. But when I put my glasses back on, I can see you. My hair is ruined from it. Your chance to hear that there is a huge amount of support out there uh, in Denmark to bring um, startups to the global markets and how collaboration is basically key. Seated here, we have two lovely gentlemen. We have Eske Paul Rosenberg, from the, who is the Science Attaché from Innovation Center Denmark, Seoul in Korea. And here is Mikkel Maritz Marfeldt, who is Director of Investor Relations and New Strategic Initiatives for the company Labster. And over the next 25 minutes, uh, we're going to be hearing how Innovation uh, Centre Denmark has helped this particular educational tech startup to, um, well, how it's basically helped it and, and, um, and helped it to develop uh, beyond Denmark. But before we do that, we need to set the scene. So I have to say, as a Brit who's very keen to carry on living in this country, I'm extremely uh, glad to be introducing a minister to the stage. So would you please give a very large round of applause to the Minister of Higher Education and Science, Inna Helsbo Jürgensen. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure being here. It makes me proud walking around here to see some of the best and most promising European startups gathered here in Copenhagen. I know you're busy people, so allow me to go straight to the point. The world needs your innovative minds to tackle the problems we face. Europe has a balanced approach to technology with strong root in our democratic values and ethics, and the world needs that. So, whether we talk about climate issues, imbalance in society, or lifestyle diseases, your ideas and solutions are key, period. Now, for the more patient of you, please allow me to continue, because startups create progress. Progress is important to society, but we need to understand that progress has to be sustainable. Climate change is the most challenging threat we face. If we don't tackle it, the consequences are grim. In Denmark, we want to reduce the CO2 emissions by 70 percent before 2030. It's an ambitious goal, and we need clever startups like yours to reach it. Take the Danish startup Each Thing. They have created a solution that can help consumers choose everyday products that match their needs and values. You take your smartphone and scan your product. Immediately, you're provided with all sorts of information. Is, it producing, is this product affecting CO2 emissions? Is it sustainable? Can it be recycled? Etc. Each thing is using top-notch algorithms, blockchain and machine learning to create a smarter and better world. They base their solution on good Danish values. Values such as trust, transparency and ethical considerations. They make good business out of doing good. We need more of that. Denmark is a small country, so in order to stay on top, of competition, we need to reach out to the rest of the world and connect to the knowledge available there. The best tool to speed up international cooperation is our eight Danish innovation centers. They're located in some of the world's most significant innovation hotspots. They provide you with tailored advice within areas like tech, life science and clean energy. Use them. I'm sure the company Labster here will tell you more in a minute. Labster participated in a program provided by the Innovation Center in Silicon Valley. Later, they joined our center in Seoul and Shanghai and got introduced to the local edtech environment. Today, Labster is recognized as one of the best providers of virtual lab solutions in the world. So to conclude, you have so much to offer. 
European values like ethics, respect and transparency are part of your corporate DNA. The world needs your mindset in order to develop the technologies of tomorrow. Use the innovation centers as your starting gate and let them help you conquer the world. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Whoops, I'll just drop my, have a phone for free. <laughs> Thank you. That's my way of getting a passport. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know you're a busy woman, so I'm going to let you go because I'm going to interview these chaps, but what you say is going to weave in today. So thank you very much. Big Thank round you. of applause. Thank you. <laughs> so apart from trying to give my phone away as a sneaky way of staying in this country, um, what I want to do now is I want to invite ourselves into a hooky chat so that we can actually discover a little bit more about you two gentlemen and the relationship that, that came and the benefits that rose. The way that I want to start that is I want to start with you, Mikkel, because I think it's important that we try to set the scene and to try to understand you as a company before you got involved with ICDK. So can you lay the land and just set us out as to what you were as a company, what you were doing, and lead us up to that point when, when these guys got involved? Absolutely. So just a quick uh, scene setting for those of guys, those of you who don't know us. We are um, providing virtual simulations for training for science students around the world and also for employees today. And actually our sort of idea came out of a frustration from one of our founders who was doing a PhD in biotechnology at the DTU, Danish Technical University, and never really got access to all the cool science equipment because that typically costs 10 million US dollars if you want the really cool stuff, right? So that access, if you can't get it in real life, why don't you build it virtual, just like you've done with airplanes, right? So you can think of us as the flight simulator for everything else, cool science, technical equipment. That's what we do, just to set the scene. Um, that idea was great, but it wasn't viable in a market back then. So we had to, and I was one of the early people going to the US, um, we were actually two people employed in Denmark, uh, spearheading all of the US activities back four years ago when I, when I joined. And that was one big uphill game, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I mean, we're talking um, no one knowing us, of course, but also just the fact that when you Googled lobster, everything was autocorrected to lobster. That's a frustration when you actually try to push your company into the virtual space, right? So one of the things that we did early on was, uh, was uh, a colleague of mine, he went, we knew we had to go to a talk um, with where Google was attending, actually a stage semi like this, where Google was attending, we had to speak next to them. And one of my colleagues, he went on stage with a lobster costume, <laughs> red costume, full body costume. And from that day on, something clicked inside Google and we were actually not autocorrected after that point. So we're really sort of early stage, how do you seed the market? And we were just road tripping universities uh, over in the US. Um, at some point, we got to the stage where we actually figure out how to get a product market fit. And one of the things that we learned was actually from one of the programs that we participated in at ICDK in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's called Scale It and it helps you realize, I think, what you're doing as an early startup. And so that was your first interaction with ICDK? Yes, you could say so. Okay, so hold that part of the story. Let's jump over to Eske then. So Eske, tell us a little bit more about these kind of programs and how they operate and, and how people like Mikkel get involved in those programs. Well, the Scale It program is a five-day quick and dirty uh, speed tour into one of the ecosystems that the innovation centers are placed in. And uh, our colleagues in Silicon Valley, where Mikkel actually also worked at some point. Uh, so we also foster talent. <laughs> no, but uh, they uh, give the startups an idea about whether there's a product market fit. They give them honest, direct feedback for as many uh, investors and connectors as possible. And by the end of the day, the startups, they have a lot of dots in a matrix. And they are told to draw the line between the dots and create a pattern. And either you figure out that you, know, you have a product that is the perfect fit and you can just go ahead and you can continue to work with us and you can find investors and you can find partners, or you go home and you turn and twitch the knots a little bit in order to make it fit. And I think that 90% of the startups that have participated in the Scalix program go home and they turn the knots before they come back uh, in another context. Now I know, I mean, retrospectively with all these things, there's always a danger of these events that when you look back, it always seems like 
all the stars just align perfectly. But how is it? Do you have to dress up as a lobster, or do you have to? What? How, how is it that people, uh, or even you have to work for the organisation? How, how do you find them, or they find you? I mean, how does that matchmaking work in terms of that initial meetup? How we find the startups to work with? You tell me. How does it? How does it work? Do I? Well, uh, we for starters, we we participate in events like this, and we try to communicate what we do. Uh, but we also try to be part of the ecosystem. We try to be partners for a long time where we have many discussions. Me and Mikkel met each other, well, not the first time, but the second time, uh, just like one and a half years ago when they were looking into Asia. And we had, I think, a lot of discussions and a lot of, uh, not negotiations, but dialogue leading up to the fact that we tried to do another activity in the Korean market. Uh, so in that sense, it, it requires a partnership, it requires ongoing conversations, it requires to figure out, okay, what's the best solution for you right now? So what we call tailored services. But I imagine, I imagine there must be some kind of vetting process. I mean, there's, there's probably billions, I hope you don't mind me saying this, there's probably billions of Mikkels out there, uh, clearly not as good looking. Not in Denmark. But, <laughs> but, and there's only a few of you, so, so how does that filtering process work? Um, you can't be having all these in-depth conversations with all these different Mikkels. Again, luckily, we, we have a headquarters in, in Denmark that are, of course, are closer to the ecosystem than we are. Uh, the ones that are posted at different uh, locations around the world, we try to get back as much as often, maybe four or five times per, per year, where we have a pretty busy calendar meeting as many startups and many companies and research institutions as possible. They're also part of our stakeholder group. So we just try to be out there. We try to figure out what's going on, who's, uh, who's picking uh, over the top to, to who could be the next scale-up that we can work with. Okay. And those programs that we run, one of the reasons why we run these programs and we call it Scale It is also in order to repeat it. So hopefully we will have a brand that people look to when they are thinking, okay, let's go out and have a look at the US market. Let's go out and have a look at the Korean market or the Chinese market or the Indian market or the German market and so on and so forth. So uh, we are trying to establish that. Uh, we can still be better and we are definitely uh, totally dependent on bridging ecosystems and not just run around as, as, as uh, one-man armies uh, individually, but bridging ecosystems, I think, is an okay. key, important key ingredient in what we do. Let's go back to Mikkel's uh, story. So I want to continue the story yeah, yeah. Uh, previously on ER. Yeah. I do want to say that our go-to-market approach is not to dress up in lobster costumes. Okay, right. Uh, that's, uh, we do. But there you were in the States working with this guy, but it didn't end there, did it? Because you did much more, and I know that you well, yes. carry on with the... Precisely. So, so what happened was we, we tried multiple market approaches. And one thing was being on the road, meeting university leaderships and so on. We sell to universities mainly. Um, one thing that did work really well was to set up a sales office and actually have phone calls. So now we have 35 people sitting in Boston, phoning all day long and s doing amazing work. Okay. And this turned out to be sort of our perfect product market fit. Our product sells well with this type of sales approach. That we can fuel, and we are fueling that in the US. At the same time, we've been driving two investor rounds. Um, the first investor round, we raised 10, uh, 10 million US dollars. Um, and the last one we concluded in February, um, we raised 25 million US dollars, our Series B. And what happened just pre that phase where we actually concluded in February was we could see investment would come in. We know that we are doing well in the US, we can fuel the US. What do we do about new markets? If we want to generate more revenue, build new verticals and so on, the time is now before the investment comes in to start planning for Asian markets. And that's where we started assessing ICDKs as well, and they were assessing us back. Right. So now, so you're, you're doing well in the States, things seem to be going well, people seem to be bringing out the green dollar, and now you're thinking about going east and he heading towards the Asian markets. Yes. When you say assessing ICDK, what, 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 what is it? What, it sounds like sort of dogs sniffing each other in a park. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean what, what sort, of, ex what of, sort of things are you looking for in terms of their competences? And, what, and then I'm going to come to you, Eska, and find out what were you yep. sniffing around in Mikkel's competences. Uh, from our point, standpoint, one thing is um, knowing your own position and your weaknesses and figuring out what is it that a governmental affiliated organization such as ICDK can help in bringing those weaknesses uh, or re reducing those weaknesses. And being an educational technology company, we sell mainly to universities and to high schools and colleges. When you do that in Asian markets, there's a very sort of centralized approach to building curriculum and making decisions on purchases of products. And us coming with the blue stamp from a foreign ministry 
government organization saying, we can sort of vouch for this new company, Labster, that's a huge upside. For us, I think we've, we've cut away six months of just you know, being out there and trying to generate networks. You're, you're nodding the head there. You, you, this that is something sounds you, good. <laughs> it sounds good. Yeah. It sounds good. But is there a cultural aspect to that? I mean, are we saying that there are certain countries, certain territories, whereby, for example, having that government stamp kind of works for your favor, and that you have to sort of be conscious of that? And I mean, is that something that you're very conscious of? I mean, I don't, you work in Korea. You know how it works over there? We are eight centers located at eight very different locations. Uh, even though there are many similarities and we try to uh, be as uniform as possible and we're also good at using each other, we can come back to that later in the Asian region. Of course, we're also different. So our colleagues in Silicon Valley, uh, it probably doesn't matter f for the stakeholders that they meet that they come with a royal imprim or a business card that says something about royal embassy. Whereas in Asia, it, 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 it really means something. Right. And uh, also, as you mentioned, it's, it's some of the decision processes are centralized with the government pushing in new strategies that the private sector is then adopting or the educational sector. And so the fact that we can also have like triple helix uh, focus areas when we introduce to people like public, private, what's the last one? Academia, sorry. Mm -hmm. the, um, that also, of course, gives us an edge uh, to maybe a private consultancy. But that's really interesting. So in a way, I mean, clearly it, it stands to reason that the various different people in working in the eight different centers are sort of culturally sensitive to the needs and wants. And is that something that you felt that you were able to do and that those sensitivities were coming out in those conversations when you were kind of assessing the, the, the value that ICDK in Korea were going to be able to give you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think there's... Um, I ICDKs can't solve your, your problems. You need to know the problems and then have them help with some of it. But it's, it's you knowing your own business, first of all. And as you say, ICDK probably wouldn't be the best fit for us selling into an education market in the US. Um, but having said that, they provide a, a, a unique standpoint that you can't get from consultancy services such as you know, you know, one of the, some of the major ones because they don't have the government stamp, right? Right. And that has just a significant value in Asian markets. Right. I understand. So on a very practical note, I mean, how does this all work? Is this by you speaking over Skype, through email, uh, texting, uh, WhatsApp, or are you, having to go, are you having to go on an airplane, go all the way there, sit with Esker in a room and thrash it out? I mean, what's the sort of process like? What's the process of establishing a fruitful relationship? Uh, I don't really know. Well, I've always had a little bit of a thing for Lapster, I think. So when we were asked by a conference in Korea to help invite Labster to do a keynote at an EdTech conference, I think that's where the magic started to happen in, in our uh, little uh, love story. Uh, and we had many discussions back and forth. And in the beginning, uh, Labster was like, yeah, 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 it's fine, but you know, uh, we can probably do this ourselves. And then we started to talk about, okay, what is it that you plan to do? And we learned that, okay, we're going to use the Series B to enter into the Asian markets. And we were like, okay, we want to help with that. What can we do? What are you doing? Well, we have our own guy. He helped like launch Unity into Asia, so he pretty much knows everybody. And then I asked again, okay, who's everybody? And then we figured out that, okay, everybody was actually not everybody in the sense that we also knew somebody that we could add to the picture and add to the table. In particular, we could put together the research institutions that were you know, driving the, the, the way forward in, in the Korean context. We mm -hmm. could set up a meeting with the Ministry of Education where, uh, not you, but Maruf and I checked out what they had been doing themselves in terms of the edtech space, and we could sort of see, okay, there's still a way to go for the Koreans. Mm -hmm. So I think it was like ongoing discussions for maybe a couple of months where we, every time I was in Denmark, I stopped by to have a cup of coffee, and maybe we, I also called you maybe once or twice too much just to be sure that there was a stone that we hadn't turned in order to figure out how we could sort of be complementary to the process that was already ongoing. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because in, in some ways, if, if people simply just thought that you were some sort of gateway to VCs uh, and, 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 and they could just see the money, that would be a wrong understanding of what you guys can offer. Because from what I understand, um, you, you told me when we were preparing for this, if I got this right, that just the fact that they could actually find a good venue where yeah. you could go, I mean, that... Th that, that and just to give some concrete examples. So, for example, coming full circle to the lobster slash lobster <laughs> story, uh, we ended up making a major partnership with Google, um, pushing uh, our product in the US, then promoting it quite a lot. That parallel we were looking for in the Asian markets. So Tencent, Alibaba, 
you know, companies like this, we, we would like to have a conversation with them. And ICDK in Shanghai was very quick to actually set up these, these uh, the, the relevant people within these companies. Um, so that's one place where they s could really push it. Besides, you know, helping with venue and setting up activities with university leadership and so on. Tell me a little bit when we when we prepared for this and we talked to uh, in advance. You told me about about the, there's a woman that's actually working kind of on your behalf, right? Yes. In Shanghai. Yes. Tell that's us a bit true. more about that because I was that's fascinated true. by that. And I do want to I do want to sort of put out the caveat. If you heard the con the uh, ma main stage uh, conversation uh, early this morning around 10 o'clock with some of the uh, biggest unicorn uh, successes in Denmark, trying to go into the, especially Chinese market, it's not easy. And we haven't done that yet, but we are in the process of doing it. There's still a lot of things that can go wrong, just to set the caveat for that. But one thing that is really good when you are entering these new markets is the ability to tap into resources um, at the Innovation Center in Shanghai, also in, in Seoul, they have an ed tech educational technology dedicated person as a resource that can go in and you can basically pay an hourly salary for this person to be very flexible, jump in and out of, uh, of products, uh, projects. And that's a huge benefit, first of all, because they, I mean, they, they are translating. Besides actually knowing the field, they also work as fantastic translators. And the one that we've used a lot in Shanghai, she can go pitch our product now, that's despite great. being you know, employed at ICDK Shanghai. Right. Okay, so, so that's something. And do you do that in Seoul as well? Do you have people that are kind of sitting there that you can kind of s uh, sell out on an hourly basis? Or is that just something they're doing in Shanghai? We are constantly waiting, sitting like this, waiting <laughs> for people to call. No. But yes, we do have staff that we can, of course, throw into the equation if it's needed for, for certain clients. And we have different sector focuses. We have different uh, volumes in terms of staff members. And so we have a clean tech officer, a life science officer, and an ICT officer. In, and this is the ICT, uh, you know, sector that we're talking about, seen from our perspective, whereas Shanghai are so lucky to have a few more. So they have a one that is down deep into the vertical of EdTech, which is just amazing. Uh, so we have different volumes, different sizes, different sector focuses. I would say that it's very few of us that doesn't go across uh, life science, ICT, and clean tech, um, no matter How where you are in the world. What's your, uh, just between you and you and uh, Mikkel and my mate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's, what's your network effect like uh, in terms of the different eight centers? I mean, do you work quite closely? Do you ever find yourself having people come to you and then you're sort of batting them back over to Munich and then they're batting them over to yeah. Bangalore or where it was? I mean, or, 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 or do you, does everything just get fed back centrally back to Denmark and then they kind of work it from there? I mean, how connected are you as a kind of a... I would say we are very well connected. Of course, regionally there are some synergy effects that are more, uh, you know, uh, likely to for follow in, for example, the Seoul or Sao Paulo or something like that. In the case of Labster, which is again a great example, you started out small in Korea. That same kind of surface offering was then going to Shanghai and to our colleagues at the Trade Council in um, in Tokyo. So that's an example of how, you know, we tried out in one market and then it was relatively easy and quick to sort of do the same thing with our colleagues that we, of course, can introduce to in, in one or two seconds. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's how we can use the network of representations and innovation centers uh, relatively quick and dirty. Uh, in our context in Korea, we also work with our uh, colleagues to set up like uh, these one week uh, scale it programs, but where we maybe stop uh, in uh, both Shanghai and in Seoul or in Seoul and Tokyo advertisement. We're doing a scale it Seoul and Tokyo in March 2020 in connection to Slots Tokyo. So if anybody's interested, uh, reach out afterwards. But that's also one way of trying to decrease costs for companies from Denmark, from institutions from Denmark that might be going out on a leash looking towards Asia for the first time. Why not go in and have a, have a sneak peek in two locations within one week? It's pretty, I would say, uh, cost-effective and, 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 yeah, quick and dirty. Mikkel, um, what advice would you give to startups? Um, I, I, I gather there are a few out there. Uh, in terms of what, where they need to be in their business, what they need to have behind them in order to make, you know, what is the right uh, point at which they're kind of mature enough in order to be able to get the most out of these guys? Or do you see it as a series of different points? Because it sounds to me like there yeah. are certain sweet points within, sweet spots within your yeah. journey. I would probably say start the, the conversation early with the ICD case. If you're looking to become a global startup and not a regional or even Danish startup. Could you just qualify that? Because that's the interesting. You just said that 
quite early, but what does that really mean? Because one of the things I got, sorry to interrupt you, but one of the things I got the, from the ministry was a sense that there is this feeling now that says, look, that, that we need to bring the sense of going global earlier within the process. And that actually one of the problems is that, is that dare I say it, that maybe Danes sometimes start a bit small and stay a bit small. And that actually this notion of going global should be brought earlier. So should come, I mean, how early and what do you really mean by early? Um, I think you should, you, you can't start early enough. I agree. Okay. F funny enough, in the case of Labster, we actually, we were founded as a non-profit organization, mainly delivering free simulations to high schools in Denmark. And our, one of our founders went to Harvard Medical School and the professors over there said, it's such a good idea, why on earth aren't you trying to build a business case on it and actually make an impact globally instead of just having a very small market. So that's sort of one of the things that fuel that and we, that was as early as it could get. SK, you were going to say something. I right? just want to echo that, like uh, start <laughs> as early as possible, even before maybe you, are fine, uh, you have finalized your business model and you know that it works in a Danish context. Of course, we can work with, with these different startups at different times of the life cycle in different ways. But just to give an example, the first batch we have in, had in Korea at our first Gillette Korea, that was actually through our collaboration with the Danish University's Innovation Hubs where we had like five startups coming from uh, DTU, uh, uh, KEA, uh, or University of Southern Denmark, or something like that. And to be honest, if we can get some of those out as early as possible, also in an Asian context where maybe normally the Danish startups tend to look a little bit like lapsed to the west first and then to the east maybe a little bit later, around Series A or B or something like that. If we can get them out to test the pro product market fit, to maybe give them some inspiration that, okay, actually there are some opportunities here, but we might want to twist this in a direction where it caters for a different market, uh, where maybe the potential, I wouldn't say it's, it's the potential is bigger, but maybe it's a little less tapped than, uh, than US, not to take that away from anybody, then uh, we would be thrilled. So I would say like, come out and get some first-hand impressions, take the conversations whenever we are home uh, that you can get. And then of course, depending on where you are and your growth uh, phase, it will be different things that you are asking for. Now we ran, uh, you and I ran a session this morning uh, with a bunch of VCs from Korea and China and India, and we had a bunch of young startups pitching to them. And I think one of the really interesting takeaways from that was this notion that actually, I think one of the guys said, I think the Indian chap said it, he said, you know, don't try and do it all yourself. And this idea that one of the most valuable things you can do when you go into a country like one of those is to actually, is to find not just uh, pathways for distribution, but actually find uh, partners that can actually, and that, that's something that you, you advocate, right? We are an innovation center. We are not a trade center. And that means that innovation often goes in a collaboration or a partnership of some sort. Hence, we are constantly focusing on finding different kinds of constellation in terms of partnerships, be it uh, business to business or uh, public private or, or, or what have you. Uh, but that is, in essence, what we do. And that's also why that we spend a lot of our free time to bridge the ecosystems, not only the individual companies. That's lovely to have long processes with individual companies where you can really make a difference. But by the end of the day, we're also a public uh, government institution where we are trying to put in some of the taxpayers' money to bridge the ecosystems so that something sustainable will still be there after we are gone. Uh, a concrete example for that could be a Danish cluster organization called Clean. They're right out here. They have a partner that we have set them up with in Korea, that is a research agency. Now they are writing applications together, uh, targeting, for example, Euro Eurostars or targeting uh, something called P4G. And, and that all of a sudden creates projects with third party funding where Danish companies and research institutions are working together with Korean uh, counterpartners because the ecosystem players are doing something without our help. So by the end of the day, if we can have stuff like that happening all over the place without our help, is actually a perfect case story. Uh, so we focus a lot on bridging ecosystems and create sustainable platforms for collaboration. And then, of course, we work on an individual basis with companies and research institutions as well. Right. Now, here you go, Mik uh, uh, Mikkel. Um, the, the question to ask is, if you had not engaged with these people, I, I still believe you'd be a successful company, but where do you think you'd be now had you not engaged with ICDK? Where, where do you think you'd be lacking or, or what, would, what, what different story would you be telling right now? Uh, well, we would be a lot of learnings uh, less, we, we would have less learnings experienced, uh, experienced from an early on. So we would be, as I said, probably half a year setback. And you shouldn't underestimate the power of half a year 
when you're running uh, investor rounds. Typically, there's sort of a, a saying within the community that you, uh, you raise rounds between 18 and 24 months. So half a year in that sense, that's a lot. Especially when you get an investment, you want to fuel the company to gear the company and then actually you see an effect of that investment, right? So just that in itself is uh, incredibly valuable. But I also think that in some cases, we, we couldn't have gotten that within half a year. Some of the government conversations couldn't have happened. Um, so in our case, the, the industry and the ICDK uh, activities is a really good fit. Right, okay. So I get, I get the impression your advice is to startups is to go and knock on these, these folks' doors, right? It is, it is. But also be critical about yourself and also be critical about the region that you're entering with an ICDK because they can do different things and they can't s save you or solve your problems, but they, c they can help you. Brilliant. That I'm that <laughs> no, that's completely fine. I, I, I could talk forever, but I'm not going to say. I think we should give a big round of applause, don't you think? Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Mikkel, and thank you very much to Eska, and thank you very much. <laughs>